praise God, I'm saved. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord for that. John chapter uh, 4, if you join me in standing in honor of the reading of God's word, we'll read the first 11 verses of John chapter 4. All right, we'll get ready here. John chapter 4, verse number 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a, a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? We'll preach on this verse, verse 10. Jesus saith unto her, If thou knewest, and the title of the message this morning is this, If you only knew, if you only knew. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us and the privilege we have to be in your house the privilege we have to sing praises to you, Lord. I think about the song, Praise God, I'm Saved. I'm thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ. And we just read about uh, walking in uh, Samaria. Um, we're th I'm thankful that he came. I'm thankful that he offers living water. I'm thankful that we can come to him. I pray you'd help us uh, to, to walk with you through him, Lord, I pray. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit, Lord. I, I am uh, uh, nobody, I am, I am nothing, I have nothing to offer anyone outside of your word, outside of what you've given me. And so I pray, God, that we'd magnify your word this morning, magnify your son, uh, that uh, you'd be lifted up, your son would be lifted up, that uh, we'd be uh, uh, encouraging, help, helping, uh, comforting to those that hear. Fill me with your spirit, I beg and plead, and uh, we'll fill each hearer with your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. Our text this morning finds Jesus Christ and his disciples leaving Judea, going to Galilee, and needing to go through Samaria. We aren't told why he must needs go through Samaria, though many have uh, made uh, suggestions or assumptions. It could have been because of time restraints. If he did not, we know that uh, Judea is in the south, Galilee is in the north, and uh, Samaria is somewhat in between. And so uh, if you were going to go from Judea to Galilee, you could go out across the Jordan River and out around in the, the wilderness, if you will, and then come back into Galilee uh, uh, there by the Sea of Galilee. You could do it that way. Uh, uh, but it would take longer to do that rather than going through Samaria. And so maybe he needed to go through Samaria because of time restraints. Uh, uh, maybe he needed to go through Samaria uh, because of weather or road conditions or uh, uh, bandits or thieves or whatever on different roads. Whatever the case may be, many have said that it, it was because he had an appointment with this woman of Sychar, whom we call the woman at the well, or the Samaritan woman. Many have said, well, the reason he must needs go through Samaria is he knew that she was going to be there, and so he had to go there. Whatever the reason, the Gospel of John gives us, and by the way, only the Gospel of John, this account is not given in any of the other three Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of John gives us this account of Jesus becoming wearied with his journey. And that's interesting that, that though Jesus, we preached about uh, uh, Jesus being all God and having the, the fullness of the God head bodily, though he uh, uh, is, is God. I can't see Brother Martin's face. That right there is in the way. Sorry, I was that snowflake was right. Uh, that's better. Okay, all right. Uh, I, every time I looked at Brother Martin, there's a snowflake right there. And uh, let's put it in front of Mrs. Martin's face. No, I'm joking. Sorry, I got distracted by that. Uh, um, where was Jesus was God. Jesus is God. 
But it's interesting that, that God allowed himself to be uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the flesh to, to uh, uh, as he was in the flesh, uh, allowed himself to be constrained by uh, what the flesh is constrained by. Uh, you and I, if we walk for a long time, we get wearied because we are flesh. And though Jesus is all God and Jesus was all God, it's interesting to me that God allowed himself in Jesus Christ uh, to be uh, constrained by human constraints, by being wearied and tired. Uh, there's no way that he could literally be God in the flesh. That he's, there's no way he could give us salvation. There's no way he could be uh, what he needed to be for us if he had not known what we knew. What a blessing that is. What an encouragement that is. He was tempted in all points as we were. And so here is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, becoming wearied with his journey. Sitting at Jacob's well about the sixth hour, we know that the sixth hour is around noon, and, uh, uh, and meeting this Samaritan woman. The, the Samaritans were people of um, partlies is the word I'm going to use. Partialities is not the right word. The word I have is partlies. They were partly. Uh, they had partly obeyed. If you remember back in the book of Nehemiah, when we were preaching through the book of Nehemiah on, uh, uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, the, the people that had settled in the area of Samaria were people that had partly obeyed. They didn't obey God completely. They, were, they, were, uh, uh, they had not conquered those people. They had made peace with many of those people. And so they were Jewish people who had settled there. And then, not only did they not conquer the people they were supposed to conquer, but they had, uh, uh, they had intermingled. And so they were, they had partly obeyed. They were partly Jewish. They weren't all Jewish. They had not completely obeyed. And as a result, they, they had mixed marriages. And we go back again to the book of Nehemiah. And you remember how that many uh, of those uh, Jews had, had married uh, Moabites and had married Ammonites. Well, that's where they were settling. That's where they settled in that area, in the area of Samaria. And so when we think about uh, uh, that area uh, of Samaria, and you say, well, they were partly Jewish, and, and, and sometimes uh, uh, we think, well, uh, the reason they were, they were looked down on is because of uh, ethnicity. No, the reason they were, they were uh, that, that people tried to skip over Samaria, the reason people looked down is because they had not been obedient to God. They, they, had, they had partly obeyed, they were partly Jewish, they were partly religious. They had some idea of Scripture. They knew what Scripture said. And we can see here they uh, had, uh, and sp specifically she had partly understood Scripture, but not completely. And isn't that true about many people today? And they, they have uh, an idea of what Scripture ha has said. They have an idea of what the Bible is, is, is saying. They have an idea uh, of, of the Word of God. They have an idea of who God is, but they don't really know. And that was uh, the Samaritan people as a whole, but specifically this Samaritan woman who lived in Sychar, who came out to the well at noon. And, and she was, uh, and we won't get into this, isn't really even in my notes, but uh, she was even, a, 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 you think about an, uh, the Samaritan as being uh, rejects. She was a reject of the rejects because uh, of her marital status, because of her, the lack of, of uh, morality in her life. She had been married uh, five times, and the man that she was with at that time was not her husband. And so the reason she was there at noontime was because uh, she didn't want to be, or other people didn't want to be around her, other ladies didn't want to be around her. And so here we have a Samaritan, a people of partlies. Uh, they had partly obeyed. They were partly Jewish. They were partly religious. They partly understood the scriptures, and she was all of that. As Jesus was sitting at the well with the disciples away in the city to buy meat, Jesus asked this Samaritan woman for water. In asking this woman for water, he said, that he, he said what he wanted her to say. Notice in verse number uh, 7, there cometh a woman of Samaria, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, water, uh, to draw water, Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. And though it was Jesus that was asking this question, he was desiring that she ask him that question. Interesting to me that the question that he wanted her to ask was what he asked her. 
And it's, it's also amazing to me how often Jesus used his physical need. We talked about uh, Jesus being God in the flesh. It's, off, it's interesting to me how often Jesus used his physical need to accomplish a spiritual goal or a spiritual need. Uh, he must needs go through Samaria. Now, Jesus was God, is God. Jesus could have just uh, appeared in, in Galilee. He could have, uh, uh, you know, think of uh, interdimensional. God can do whatever he wants. And God could have just entered, been in Galilee. In fact, remember after he had uh, uh, resurrected, after he had died on the cross and resurrected, and before he ascended, remember he just appeared in the upper room with the disciples. Hey, he could have done that before his death, as, just as much as he did after his death, but he allowed his physical need to accomplish a spiritual goal. I must needs go through Samaria. He needed a drink. Hey, physically, he said, I have to have something to drink. I'm, I'm sitting at the well. It's the, the middle of the day and it's hot out here. I need a, a drink. Do you think God, Jesus, uh, God himself needed water? God is the one who told uh, 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 Moses to strike the rock and, and get rock from a, 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 a water from a rock. Uh, G this is the one, Jesus Christ, who turned water uh, from wine, took wine and turned it to water. Jesus could have done anything he wanted to, and yet he allowed his physical needs, and this is important, he allowed his physical needs to uh, be used for a spiritual goal. Uh, we could even go further and say he had to die. Jesus, God himself, had to die. He didn't have to die. For the wages of sin is death. Did Jesus sin? He didn't sin. And so his physical need allowed, to, uh, allowed him to accomplish a spiritual goal. How often do we desire to use a spiritual means to obtain a physical need? How often are we exactly opposite of Jesus Christ? How often do we uh, uh, desire something from God uh, physically and we, we, we use spiritual means to accomplish a physical goal? For instance, and we're going to get into some of this, but uh, uh, prayer. How often is, is prayer not at the, means, uh, a, uh, uh, the, the means for a spiritual goal, but it's a means for a physical goal? Goal, And so we have this relationship with God. It's a, fit, it's a spiritual relationship that, that we come to God in spirit. And yet, often our spiritual, uh, 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 our spiritual, we use spiritual means to accomplish a physical goal. Can I say that this woman was in the same group? Look what she says. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew... Asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which uh, gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. She referred, referred to Father Jacob uh, as one that partook of this well and bestowed it upon them and asked Jesus if he was greater than Father Jacob. She didn't realize that Jacob had the well because of the promise of Jesus and not the other way around. Do you understand what I'm saying? God gave Abraham, God gave Jacob a promise of Jesus Christ. And because of that promise, God blessed them. Because of, uh, of their obedience to, to, to uh, uh, God through that promise, God began to bless them. And not the other way around, not uh, uh, that they had these uh, uh, benefits just because God desired to bless them. The, the, they had the promise. Do you understand what I'm saying? They, they, God had, had chosen and, and blessed, uh, had, had uh, given them a promise, and because they obeyed that promise, God began to bless them. Not that they were, they were blessed uh, first, and then they got a promise later. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is that there was a spiritual act first, and God blessed physically. Does that make sense? Am, am I being clear? But all that she saw was the physical desires being met. She had completely lost the spiritual 
uh, promise, the spiritual needs. In fact, if she had seen the spiritual needs, she would have recognized, hey, this is a man, maybe she wouldn't have recognized but, uh, immediately, but she would have seen that this, is, this Jesus Christ is the, the, uh, uh, the, the fruition of this promise, a spiritual answer, a spiritual well. In fact, as he says to her, look what he says, thus saith the woman of Samaria, how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me? which uh, am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me a drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He said, I'm, I, if you would have known who I am, the spiritual water, living water, the type of water that you drink and never thirst again. I think that says in verse number 14, if I'm not mistaken. That, you'll, that you'll, if you, get, you drink of the water that, that I drink, you'll never thirst again. This spiritual water, she didn't understand. She said it's, uh, her, the mindset was all about the physical needs, what she could get physically. And Jesus was trying to get her to see that, that she had a greater need, a spiritual need. She didn't realize. She didn't know. Though she was aware of her history, and seemingly aware of some scriptures, she didn't know about Jesus. She didn't know about the fruition of the promise in Jesus Christ. She didn't realize. And Jesus said that here in verse number 10. He says, if thou knewest. What an indictment on her. If you only knew who I was then you could ask of me and you could have living water, spiritual water, the water that you would get, you'd never thirst again. Often uh, when I'm uh, studying or reading a passage and how I think that this, how, how, what, a, what an indictment on this woman. And then I'll pause and I'll think, what would I have done? It's often, it's easy often to be critical of those in scripture and, and think, well, how dare this person do this? Or how dare this person do this? And then I begin to think, well, what would I have done had I been in that situation? Well, uh, be before I, I uh, uh, cast stones, I better think about uh, where I could have been had I been there. If I was living in Sychar, if I was this woman, what would I have done? Before I am uh, uh, critical of her, and uh, I wonder how often I... Don't ever really realize. Oh, say, now we're talking about salvation and, and Jesus Christ is, is the, the, the living water. But even those that are saved sometimes don't really realize all that Jesus Christ has and is. We accept Christ as our Savior, and then we, we go on our way, and, and some people, sometimes people call it a fire insurance, or we, we know that we'll escape the, 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 the eternal damnation of hell, but do we really realize all? It, do you really know? If you only knew. It's not just unsaved people. And as I look around the room, uh, more of us probably, uh, more likely than not, know Christ as our Savior. More, more of us, more likely than not, have accepted Christ as our Savior. So uh, um, we're not talking about uh, uh, just the, the salvation, accepting Christ as our Savior. But even more than that, do you really know all? that you have in regard to salvation. Spiritually speaking, not physically, spiritually speaking. Many people are religious. Many people know who Jesus is. But do you know? And so I'm going to ask you the question that Jesus asked this woman. If you only knew. If thou knewest. Let me say this, number one. If we knew the extent of his provision, we would spend more time asking. If we knew the extent of his provision, we would spend more time asking. Now listen, before you get to the idea, well, I, 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 God is a, a God of, of great blessings and we need to ask and he's going to give and give and give and, and, and I need a, a bigger house and I need another car and, and I need a bigger bank account. And, uh, remember we said God gives and deals with in the spiritual realm and, and the, the physical realm is a, is a side benefit. I'm talking about the spiritual realm. Look, look in your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. This is a, a passage we preach on often. And more often than not, Matthew chapter 7, we talk about spiritual things. Matthew chapter 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. 
For everyone that asketh receiveth, and him that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread will give him a stone, and if he ask a fish will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And so we see here in this passage that uh, Jesus is saying, Jesus is teaching on the mount, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount here, and he's teaching and he says, uh, uh, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Well, let me say this physically, God blesses in great ways. If we knew the extent of his provision, we would spend more time asking, God does bless. Think about uh, the, the different miracles that he, Jesus did. In almost every case, there was a physical blessing. Jesus does bless physically. Jesus does uh, bless in, in ways that, that I'm, I look back on my life and I think there's no way that I could have gotten uh, uh, through that or, or, or there's no way that, that uh, I, would have, uh, I could have physically been able to, to, to uh, uh, get through that situation if it weren't for God's blessing. Physical blessings. And we could uh, enumerate all the different things, whether it's finances or strength or, or health. And, and we look back and we say, well, it's God's blessing. And then it, as we look forward, we're definitely going to need God's blessings in the future. I, I still need, even though I, the, I can't, can't even count all the blessings that I've received uh, physically, financially, uh, in health, and, and all, all of those areas. And when I come to this point, I look back, I think... That, it's almost impossible to count all those blessings. I look forward, I, I still say, well, I, I need those in the future just as much or I couldn't survive. But, and if we notice this passage, it says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your, unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven? Now, God gives us physical blessings but can I say that he gives us spiritual blessings that we often don't even consider? That we often don't even... We, we think about salvation, but what about the grace of God, the mercy of God, wisdom of God? The things that we receive that, that, are, that can't even be... If we were to go back and look at all the blessings, often we say, well, I couldn't even count those. Well, we, we couldn't, but you could try. But could I ask you how much grace have you received in your life? There's no way to even quantify that. How, how much mercy have you received in your life? There's not even a way to explain that. How, how much wisdom have you received in your life? How, how much understanding or knowledge from the, God's word? How, how much discernment have you got from God? There's not even a way to quantify or to explain those things. Many of you know uh, family members or, or folks that you grew up with and, and you look back in life and you see that, that there was a point in time where God's mercy, God's grace gave you the wisdom to make a decision and someone else made a left turn and you made a right turn based on the wisdom, not on your strength or your smarts, but God's grace. Amen. And, and you look back and you say, I, that wasn't me. And God's blessed, and I don't understand, but, but I don't know how or why, but God's blessed in this area, and, and, and it's, it's, it's not even, I can't even count. You look at, we could give all kinds of different illustrations. One that, that stands out is uh, relationships with children. Uh, you look at unsaved family members or unsaved uh, 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 friends that, that have made decisions against God and their families are a disaster. Marriages are a disaster. And you say, what made it different in my life? It was God's grace. It was not me, it wasn't you, it wasn't your smarts. It was God's grace. Those are spiritual blessings that you can't even quantify. You have no idea how to explain. Now listen, those can only come from the Heavenly Father. Now, in this passage, I, I realize it's talking about physical. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Now, a physical father can give physical needs. But a physical father can't give spiritual needs. But a heavenly father can. 
a heavenly father can give us a, a spiritual needs that, that we can't even, and we look back and we can see backwards how that God's blessed, but we look forward and we say, I'm not sure exactly if God uh, 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 tarries how we're going to get through what, what's coming next, but it's only through God's grace. And so my question is this, if we knew, if you knew the extent of his provision, why don't we spend more time asking? We have access to the heavenly father. Do you remember being a, a child, a teenager, and asking your earthly father for something? Maybe even as an adult. Hey, dad, I need this. Hey, pops. That's what my brother and sister call my dad. Hey, pops, can I get this? Hey, dad, can I... If we were willing to ask our dad and depend on him physically, an earthly father, why do we, and, and, and listen, I knew the extent of his abilities to bless physically, my physical father, my earthly father. Why don't I spend more time with my heavenly father? And not just asking for physical needs, for spiritual needs, for spiritual strength. Uh, we get through life and we think, well, uh, I don't know the, how I'm going to be able to even get through this. Have we asked God? Have we been in his presence? Do you know the extent of his blessings? Do you know the extent of his provisions? If you understood how great he is and how, how, how great the extent of his provisions, then why do we not ask? Then why do we hesitate that, listen, we don't ask often because our flesh doesn't desire to ask God. Our flesh, uh, Brother uh, Alex in teen class preached on, uh, was preaching on slipping out of Hebrews chapter 2, and he talked about love, not the world. It's easy to say, Brother Alex, it's easy to teach, and I know you know this. It's easy to, to preach on that verse, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But oh, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I can't speak for everyone in this room, although it's probably the same for you. But this guy, this flesh has a love for the world. Has a love for the flesh. And, and Brother Alex, the reason I, I'm referencing him, he used an illustration that I had thought of actually this morning when I was praying. He said, uh, why is it that my flesh d doesn't mind at all? In fact, enjoys spending two or three hours watching a football game. And then my spirit doesn't desire to, doesn't enjoy the 20 minutes or 30 minutes in God's word or in prayer time. And I'm telling you, there is a battle that is raging in this life, in this flesh, and in your flesh that does not desire the things of God. It's a spiritual battle to spend time with God. There is, a, there is a draw from this world. There is a draw from the flesh to pull and to tug. And listen, what we often do is we just say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, uh, going into 2021, I'm going to schedule a time. I'm just going to do it. And we never ask God for the spiritual strength to be spirit filled. I've used this illustration many times uh, here and in other places, but uh, trying to do the, 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 the work of the spirit in the flesh is like throwing grenades at a house fire, trying to put the fire out. It doesn't work. We want to do the things, uh, the things of the spirit with the flesh. It doesn't work. We have to ask God, God, please help me. Why do we not spend more time in the, the, the presence of God asking for spiritual needs when we should know the extent of his provision. Quickly, I'm running out of time. Number two, if we knew the expanse of his power, we would spend less time doubting. Look at, uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 28. We have a couple of places to turn this morning. We were in Matthew 7. We'll turn to Matthew 28. Then we'll look in the book of Psalms to close out the message. Uh, Psalm, uh, Matthew 28. Verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee and, uh, and into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they, had, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So they're supposed to go. And this is, he just tells them, Go ye therefore and, and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
Now, they were doubting uh, his uh, deity, who he was, um, what was going on, whether he was going to come back. Uh, they, were, they were doubting here. And Jesus said this, his response to their doubt is this, all power is given unto me. All power is given unto me. My question is this, if we knew the expanse of his power, or my statement, I guess, we would spend less time doubting. He says, all power is given unto me. And he's, he's given us the ability to go in his power, to, to do his will and his power. And yet, some of us still, though we know his power, though that his response to them was, hey, all power is given unto me. We still doubt. Well, uh, you know, no one's going to listen to me as a witness. Uh, my, my parents aren't going to listen to me. My brothers aren't going to listen to me. My coworkers aren't going to listen to me. Uh, pastors have been encouraging people to go out on visitation. I, I, I can't do it. I, I just, Pastor, you don't understand when I, I can't talk to someone. When I stand in front of a door or, or stand in front, some, front of someone, I just stutter and, and, and I can't think of words to say. Have you heard me preach? My wife laughs at me. No one else does. <laughs> Have you heard me stutter? Have you heard me, uh, uh, Mrs., uh, well, I won't say who it was, uh, but it was uh, Brother Wright's wife, and uh, was giving me a hard time about uh, when I'm preaching, and sometimes there's a word that I just, for whatever reason, I, I, either if it's written in my notes, I can go back to it, but if it's not written in my notes, it's like uh, there's just a blank there. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll uh, stop and, and stutter and just, uh, 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 don't, I don't, I'm trying to find the right word to fit there. And uh, Mrs. Workman wants to, uh, Mrs. Workman, I'm sorry, Mrs. Workman, Mrs. Wright, uh, I would uh, apologize. She, she wants to stand up and, and, and preach for me during that time. <laughs> hey, every one of us, every one of us have weaknesses. Every one of us must depend on him. You're not looking at someone who is a great orator. You're not looking at someone with a lot of talent. I have to spend time on, on my knees with God asking for his strength and his ability. I don't have anything that I can give you. It must come from him. The, 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 why is it that many of us, well, I, I can't do that. That's not, that's not my gift or that's not my ability. That's not, that's not in my wheelhouse. We doubt that we're able to do what God's commanded us to do uh, and so, uh, because we're, what we're doing is we're doubting his power. We're not doing it in our power. But we go to him and we ask for his strength and his power, and we do it in his might. I'm not doing it. I, I have, I'm not smart enough to, to stand up and preach. I'm not smart enough to, to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I must have his strength. I must have his power. But you say, well, that, that's got to be the pastor. There's no way I could do that. There's no way I could and start listing the number of things that we need to do to be obedient to the Word of God. There's no way I could do that. Are you doubting your abilities or are you doubting His power to work in you? Are you doubting your abilities? Listen, let me say it again. Are you doubting your abilities or are you doubting His power? God can't give me the power to do that. God can't work through me. And maybe we think we're so little, I don't know what it is, but we have to realize how great God's power is Amen. and how that he can work through us. We often, uh, if we knew the expanse of his power, we would spend less time doubting. And then, let me say this, this last point. Turn, turn your Bibles to Psalm 145. I, I had endeavored to read the entire psalm. But as I look at the time, we'll probably read just the last few verses. On my... To do, I don't know if you call it a New Year's resolution or not, but I, on my to-do list uh, that I have, uh, Lord willing, this year is to memorize this psalm. This psalm, I was reading this the other day, and uh, about a week ago, and as I was reading that, I said, "This is this is a psalm I need to memorize. This is so good." There's several uh, uh, from about uh, the. the 130th or so Psalm, uh, 120th uh, uh, up until the end of the book of Psalms. This is such a good one though. I will extol thee, Psalm 145, I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and ever. 
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy, thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy good, great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious, gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak uh, of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. We could read the rest of the psalm. Let me say this. If we knew the excellence of his pers person, we would spend more time telling. If we really got a hold of, when I say knew, I'm talking about getting it down in our soul. If we really knew the excellence of his person, we would spend more time telling about him. If we really got a hold of how much he can transform that person way back there to something way over here. And we really got a hold of his grace and his, his mercy in our lives and how many spiritual blessings we've received. And how he's transformed our lives. We would want to tell the world. Look what he says. One generation shall praise thy works to another. Verse 6. And men shall speak of thy uh, might of thy terrible acts. Verse 7, they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness. Verse 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all. Verse 10, all thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts. We begin to talk about how great he is. Have you told someone recently how great God is? Have you told someone recently how good God has been to you? Maybe we've not spent enough time asking for God's blessings. Spiritually. I'm not discounting the physical blessings, but I'm talking about spiritual blessings. Well, before we criticize the Samaritan woman, before we look down at the Samaritan woman and say, well, if you only knew, you'd ask. We should ask ourselves if we only knew. Do you realize? Do you have your head around how good God's been? Do you realize how much goodness God has if, if we knew the extent of his provision? Do you know the expanse of his power? Do you know the excellence of his person? Then we should ask and doubt less and spend more time telling about Jesus Christ. Understanding how, much God's, how good God's been to us should cause us to be uh, 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 proclaimers of his greatness, of his goodness. David is a great example. Could anyone here say that they were less righteous? Let's just think about, let's, let's uh, um, personify. When I say personify, I mean make David a person. He was a person. Sometimes we try to put these, these men that are in, in Scripture on, on a different level. And certainly David was a blessed man. But, but let's think of him as a person. Was David righteous? Not in his own person. In the promises of God he was. When you think about the, the, the mistakes and the sin that David lived in, you and I are no better. And so... <laughs> the blessings, the mercies, the great, the goodness of God in David's life became so great, so wonderful to him that he had to tell. We need to spend more time asking, less time doubting, and more time telling. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us and thank you for the many, many blessings, the, the spiritual blessings, the, the uh, spiritual strength that you give us day in and day out. And though we've been blessed with much, I pray you'd help us spend more time asking and uh, less time doubting and more time telling. Help us, Lord, I pray, to tell about you, Lord, we pray. As we enter this year, help us, Lord, I pray, to be uh, greater witnesses, greater prayer warriors, more spiritual in 2021 than we were in 2020, I pray. 
with heads bowed and eyes closed, somebody would say, Pastor, I, I know without a shadow of a doubt I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I know I'm saved. I know I'm on, I'm on my way to heaven. That's me. I'll raise my hand. I have no doubt I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I know I'm saved. That's me. I'll raise my hand. Thank you. you can put your hands down. Anyone that would say, Pastor, I don't know. Would you pray for me this morning? I don't know Christ as my Savior. I have not asked Jesus Christ to save me. I don't know. Like the woman at the well, I don't know Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me? That's me. I'll raise my hand. I, I, would you pray for me? Anyone like that? I don't know Christ as my Savior. I don't know God through Jesus Christ. I'm not saved. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that? All right, then by your testimony, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're a child of God. Do you spend time on your knees with him? And if the answer is, I don't spend time or I don't spend much time at all, the question would be, why not? What prevents you? Do you really know what he has to offer? Do you really know the extent of his provision? Do you spend much time doubting? Say, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I don't think, I just worry. Or do you trust his power? Do you need to be reminded of his power? Do you, do you spend time telling? Do you realize how great he is and do you spend time telling? If any of those are the case this morning, if you need to spend more time asking, spend less time doubting, or spend more time telling, then get that right with the Lord today. Come down to the altar. Ask the Lord to give you strength to, to do His will, to do His bidding. Oh, we spend a lot of time asking for physical needs. Let's decide in 2021, I'm going to do the spiritual things and I'm going to ask for His spiritual strength to do those things. Father in heaven, we pray you bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed, we stand to our feet. The piano organ begins to play. Brother Harris begins to sing. Come to the altar. Decide you're going to do God's will in His strength.